Hey everyone, Father Lane here. You can see I'm on vacation in relax mode. I'm actually in a hotel room here in southwest Utah. But I decided while I was having a little bit of time to relax, I would go ahead and give my introduction to our Introduction to the Bible course for Pre-Theology 1 next semester. I've always enjoyed teaching this introductory course on the Bible. I've taught it now for four years, and I like it because we're able to look at the entire biblical canon. We're able to give an overview of the whole and ask, how as Catholics do we read this book written over a thousand or more years of time with so many different kinds of literature contained therein? How do we read it and make sense of it as a Catholic? Alas, this is not a new question. Nearly 80 years ago, Pope Pius XII wrote this. He said, As in our age, indeed, new questions and new difficulties are multiplied. So by God's favor, new means and aids to exegesis are also provided. He continued to say, Let the interpreter then, with all care and without neglecting any light derived from recent research, endeavor to determine the peculiar character and circumstances of the sacred writer, the age in which he lived, the sources written or oral to which he had recourse, and the forms of expression he employed. You'll notice those four different things in different colors, the four things that we're looking for when we're reading the Bible. Now, this was Pius XII back in 1943. The church's teaching has continued to evolve since then, but this is a seminal moment in church teaching because it's telling us that we can't be naive when we read the Bible. We can't just pretend it's all of one kind of literature. We can't pretend, oh, it was all written and it's neat and coherent as though it were a catechism or a textbook or a novel. It's none of those. Rather, it's a library of different kinds of literature written by different inspired human authors. Again, all inspired by the Holy Spirit. The entire Bible has the Holy Spirit as its author, but it also has a bunch of different human beings also as its author. So we're going to have a chance to explore that this semester. After an initial week of looking just at what does the church teach about the Bible, we're going to spend the rest of the semester trying to read the Bible in three dimensions. You'll see I use this graphic a lot. Three dimensions of the Bible. It has a temporal dimension that covers its history. It has a spatial dimension. That's the geography, the world in which the Bible took place. And then the artistic dimension. How is it articulated in language? The Bible is written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. It was written in a language that is foreign to all of us. These languages had their own idiom. These languages had their own manners of speaking, and we have to defer to that, realizing that this is not native to us. Moreover, the Bible took place in a real part of the world. You can see here, this is the world of the Old Testament. It's got three main parts. You've got Egypt, You've got Mesopotamia, so-called, because it's between the two rivers. That's what the word Mesopotamia means. You've got the Tigris River and the Euphrates River. Both of these regions are given their water from rivers that are irrigated and would be able to allow crops to grow. And then between these two areas, you've got Syro-Palestine, the Holy Land, which gets most of its water from rain. And so you've got three related, though distinct, ecosystems, three distinct though related societies in which the whole drama of the Old Testament takes place. And then in the New Testament, it gets a little more complicated because the gospel goes to Europe. It spreads to Asia Minor. Paul and Peter both die in Rome. The Roman Empire has conquered everything in the region. And so we have to know something about this world in order to understand what the Holy Spirit is telling us in the sacred text. In our course, we're going to proceed in a historical rather than a canonical order. In a lot of courses like this, you begin with the Pentateuch and then look at the historical books, then maybe the poetry, the prophets, and the New Testament. In our course, rather, we're going to begin with what we know about the world in which the Bible is taking place. We're going to begin in 1208 BC with the Merneptestelle, this archaeological find that proves the existence of Israel as a distinct people, and indeed proves that Egypt had gone to Canaan and had interacted with this distinct people in the 13th century BC. We'll begin in the year 1200 BC when there is no dominant overarching empire that controls the Holy Land. We'll begin in this era, the period of the judges, where the different tribes sustained themselves more or less freely. Then we'll talk about the rise of the Israelite monarchy under David and Solomon, and then later when the kingdom splits into a northern and a southern kingdom under the various kings of those two kingdoms. 
But then in the mid-8th century, the Assyrian Empire will claim hegemony not just over Mesopotamia, but also over Syro-Palestine. And so, the, for the rest of biblical history, Israel will not be truly free. Israel will live under the domination of some other foreign empire. First the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the Greeks, and then the Romans, which will be the context of the New Testament. As you can see, in class we're going to dedicate a week to each of these different major periods, and in each of these weeks we're not just going to talk about the books of the Bible that narrate these different eras. Rather, we're going to look, yes, at the books that narrate the eras, but we're also going to look at the poetry and other non-narrative books that cover these eras, and we're also going to take books that, although they are set in eras that are before any of this, think Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, we're going to take them when they were likely written or edited or further developed. We're going to see passages like this one from Genesis chapter 22, which is telling the story of Abraham offering his son Isaac as a sacrifice until he stopped at the last moment before he slaughters Isaac. There's this telltale sign in verse 14. Abraham named that place Yahweh Yireh. Hence people today say, on the mountain the Lord will provide. Today. Which today are you talking about, Genesis? Which today is it? It can't be the day in the story. It has to be some day long after that, and indeed a day within the Holy Land. So it has to be after the people have entered into the Holy Land. So this has to be set Joshua or afterwards. So we're going to have a chance to look at these books in light of subsequent history, and we're going to see they make all the more sense when you realize what's going on with the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and how the book of Genesis, yes, tells about Israel's earliest days, but make no mistake, they get their digs in at the surrounding empires. And so you can see in our 13 weeks together, after an initial week just talking about what the church teaches about the Bible, we'll have six weeks on the Old Testament, followed by six weeks on the New Testament. That initial week on March 16th about the Roman Empire, and then we're going to dedicate a week to each of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, before having a concluding week in which we'll talk about the New Testament letters and the book of Revelation. One thing you'll notice is that I teach what we call in education a flipped classroom. That is, I try to avoid lecture in class. Instead, I try to give my introductory lectures here on YouTube, and you'll have readings from textbook and from the Bible to do before we come to class. So that way we can spend our three-hour blocks each of these Tuesdays really delving into the text, debating about what it means, and going deeper, and thus not just knowing the text better, but being able to pray with it much more deeply. I look forward to having you all this semester as we go through this semester. Read well and pray well.